Question number two, you should straight away identify as a projectile motion question. Uh, you can see here we've got a golf ball that's been struck from point F to point G. Uh, we know that it is being struck at 60 degrees from the horizontal at 17 metres per second. Part A asks us to show that the speed of the ball at the highest point H up here is between 8 and 9 metres per second. Now to do this we have to understand that uh, in projectile motion the vertical and horizontal components are completely independent and so at point H where we've reached the top of the arc it has zero vertical velocity in other words it is no longer traveling up or down it is has no velocity at all vertically which means that all speed is from horizontal velocity and v x is constant because in that's one of our rules of projectile motion that the horizontal velocity is constant throughout the journey which means that we are just needing to find here the horizontal component of 17 meters per second so in this case it would be Seventeen cos sixty degrees, which gives us eight point five meters per second. Um, we can check that answer because it's a show that question. It's between eight and nine meters per second. Well, eight point five is perfect. Part B tells us that the ball reaches point H at t equals one point five seconds. So we need to calculate the maximum height of the ball. Since we're interested in the maximum height here, we're going to consider the vertical motion only. So we can use SUVAT. Where S is what we're trying to find out. That's the vertical displacement. U, we know to be 17 sine 60 degrees. V we know to be zero, this is the highest point of the journey. A is the acceleration due to gravity, that's minus 9.81 meters per second squared. And T, the question has told us, is at 1.5 seconds. Now you'll see here we actually have four knowns and one unknown, which is unusual for a, a CVAT equation. It means we can choose between different equations. They've given us slightly more information than we actually need. Uh, for this Example, I'm going to use S equals UT plus half AT squared. And we can just uh, substitute in our values here. So U is 17 sine 60 multiplied by 1.5 plus a half times minus 9.81. Let's address now why that's a minus. What I've essentially done here without saying so is that upwards is our positive direction. So that means that our velocities when the ball is moving upwards are going to be positive. It means that our displacement here from, from the ground up to H will also be positive. And it means that our acceleration, which is acting downwards, is negative. So that's why it's minus 9.81. And we multiplied that by 1.5 squared which is t and our displacement s which is also h uh, will come out at 11.0 meters part two asks us to find the distance between the points f and g so f is where the ball set off g is where the ball lands now we are considering only the horizontal motion and we know that v x is constant so we can use speed equals distance over time or velocity equals displacement over time rather than using suvat which means that our displacement between f and g s is equal to v t where v is 17 cos 60 that's the 
horizontal component of the motion. And T is 1.5 times 2. If we just look back at the diagram, we know that it takes 1.5 seconds to get from F to H. This is a symmetrical journey. There's no air resistance acting. So it will take a further 1.5 seconds to get to G. So our T here is 1.5 times 2, 3 seconds. So we multiply this out and we will find that the horizontal distance is 25.5 metres. Part C, we have the same goal for standing at F, hitting the ball with the same speed, but this time he's changed the angle to 30 degrees from the horizontal. We need to show that the ball would still land at G. This is worth three marks. There's a bit more to this one. So first of all, doing very similar steps to above, we'll find out the what's going on in the vertical component. We're interested in the time it will take the ball to reach its highest point. The reason for this is because the only quantity that can be transferred between the vertical and horizontal components is the time, and it's the time that the ball will take to go up and back down again that dictates where the ball will land. So we need to know the time it will take to get to the top, and from that we can work out, we can double that to find out the, the time it will take to get to the bottom. So uh, the displacement vertically, actually, we're not interested in this time. We know that the initial velocity u is the vertical component of the motion, which is 17 sine 30 degrees. We know that V is zero, because we're interested in the, the maximum point on its journey. Vertically, the V is zero. The acceleration we know to be minus 9.81. And the time is what we're trying to find out. So we can use V equals U plus a t rearranged to find t is v minus u divided by a v is zero so we get, end up with minus 17 sine 30 divided by minus 9.81 that gives us a time of 0.866 seconds. Now that is the time it takes to reach the top of its path. Now if we switch to consider the horizontal motion, once again horizontal motion is at a constant speed, constant velocity, so we can use speed equals distance over time, or velocity equals displacement over time, so to find our displacement here s equals vt, where v horizontally is 17 cos 30, the horizontal component of that speed, 17, multiplied by our time, which is 0 0.866 times 2, for the same reasons uh, as described earlier. If the time to, to get to the top is 0 0.866, the time to get back down again will be double that number, and that gives us an answer of 25.5 meters. Now the question was show that the ball would still land at G. Well 25.5 meters is the same as the distance we've just worked out as being between F and G. So that's consistent uh, which means we're, we could well be correct there. And finally part D asks us to compare the magnitude and direction of the two velocities as the ball lands at G and use this information to suggest uh, which trajectory would choose you would choose to travel a longer distance after hitting the, the green at G. So we're interested in what's going to happen to the ball after it lands, after it bounces at G. So the first thing to note is that since these trajectories are symmetrical, if they if both balls left at 17 meters per second, both balls would also be landing with a speed of 17 meters per second. So if both balls land with a speed of 17 meters per second, but with different angles. So the, the first ball obviously is landing at a steeper angle than the second. Now there's a couple of ways you can look at this. You can look at it in terms of uh, the first ball with a steeper angle will bounce higher or the second ball with a shallower angle will have more horizontal velocity. So I would go with this one. This is because the ball is at a shallower angle. More of that speed is tied up in its horizontal velocity than its vertical velocity compared to the first ball. So it will travel further after it lands at G. 
Thank you for watching this video from Cowan Physics. If you found it useful, please like, subscribe, and visit cowanphysics.com.